Ho, ho, happy birthday Christmas. Welcome home, Jesus. We're the pod people. It's good to see you again. I'm Matisse Van Rossum, and believe it or not, I'm not drunk this year. <laughs> I'm Cleveland Mosier, and I'm preparing my anti-aircraft cannon for uh, any reindeer, because I don't, I don't want Santa on my property. Uh, je suis Ben Chis, et je suis mauvais pere. Ha 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 ha. To any of our French listeners, on behalf of the the entirety of, of the Pod People Collective, do uh, apologize for that magnificent performance. I know you're probably overwhelmed by how accurate his French accent was. Yeah, I wouldn't have even known that it was you, Ben, if you weren't sitting in the room here with me. That was quite I mean, convincing. It helps that I have a beret on. Right That's now. true, yeah. and uh, a striped uh, turtleneck. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm really. I really went out. full into this character. The baguette's a nice touch. Well, folks, tis the season for the sleazin. Christmas time is upon us. There's not a ton of Christmas horror movies, and most of the ones that are out there are pretty shitty. But I think we got a couple of good ones this year. I'm going to say Christmas has maybe not necessarily the best horror movies, but maybe the most horror movies, even compared to Halloween, when you think about holiday, it. Yeah, yeah, you do have a whole lot of them, don't you? Yeah, and there's a lot of good ones in there. I, I will say that, too. Yeah, well, we've talked about some some good ones in the past, like Krampus and Black Christmas and Santa, Santa Sleigh. Slay. And we've also talked about some not so great, but fun ones like Silent Night, Deadly Night and Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. And Ginger Dead Man. And Ginger <laughs> Dead Man. And Ginger <laughs> Dead Man. Two. And Ginger Dead Man. What did you say? What did you say? So, you know, now, now that you mention it, you're right. There are a ton of Christmas horror movies. This year, we're going to be talking about one that I had never, ever heard of. This is a little gem that Ben uh, discovered called... Dial code Santa Claus. And can I just say, thank you. Yes. Well, <laughs> thank it, you for it discovering this. It has about this five treasure. names. It's also known as Deadly Games or Game Over or 3615 Code Pair Noel. I don't know why it has so many names. And and that's not like it goes by. Like those are like were official titles. Right? Yeah, yeah, they have weird. separate posters. Yeah. Just just weird, man. <laughs> so this is a. F- French film from 1989, directed by René Manzor and starring Brigitte Fossey, Louis Ducre, Patrick Florsheim, and Alain Lalanne. 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 La- 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 <laughs> um, uh, apologies for mispronunciations. I don't do well with French. And after um, that amazing opener, too. But this film is the story of Thomas, a very intelligent and resourceful child who's left alone with his beloved and fragile granddad on Christmas Eve when a psychopath dressed as Santa Claus breaks into their mansion and starts chasing them. Thomas will do whatever he can to save himself and his granddad. Before we even touch any aspect of this film, the less you know, the better. It's amazing. I Well, right. Uh, to an extent, I will say if you've seen Home Alone, you've seen sections of this movie, um, but in a much different light. Yeah, um, it's it's like Home Alone, but like beyond that, like everything is a delightful spoiler. Yes, like, it, yes. it is a an utter joy to go into this one knowing nothing. I um, haven't seen any content or anything for it. I'd never heard of it. I was worried it was going to be a dud. Frankly. I I actually found this movie because last year it was uh, recovered by the American Genre Film Archive and shown at uh, last year's Fantastic Fest, which is a big genre film festival. And they showed it at the very end of the year after we had all left for Christmas. And I saw the trailer for this, and it's one of those trailers where it's been cut today for an older movie. So it's cut with quotes that say, like, this is batshit insane, and what a bizarre mashup of genres, and this movie was ripped off by Home Alone, stuff like that. And I was just like, 
like so baffled because from the trailer even the production design was so high compared to like the obscurity movies that are pulled from the ether that I had to know what this was and who boy did we get one here yeah production design we I think is a one. great place to start I was expecting a low budget kind of goofy kooky French film and we actually got something with models and and like big sets massive sets uh very yeah, elaborately constructed yeah they they definitely did it was well appreciated and i think well utilized uh, yeah there's a whole lot of french style in it yes well, i will say that the the strange thing is i i also didn't think this film was going to have as high of a budget as it did just based off of the early scenes i don't know if it's the the transfer that they recovered this from or what but but it's got kind of a lo-fi look to it. Like it, it doesn't look the greatest. It's that lighting. It's, it's the really lighting. Flooded. It's got it's well, it's really high key lighting and it's soft, like old Hollywood lighting, like what they do on like starlets to to you know make them look more glamorous. Everything is like really soft and gently lit and has like a, a kind of hazy glow to it. What what I love about that is it totally falls into the conventions of like your typical lifetime or uh yeah. tv christmas movie it children's exactly christmas like movie that. corniness yes in in terms of its style and then it just takes such a right turn about halfway in it really leans into this children's christmas movie feeling and then it takes a bizarre turn into like a home invasion slasher and it's such a weird mashup of genres that I wasn't expect. I don't think any of us were. No, expecting I was like, like asking during the film. I was like, why are we watching this for the podcast? This is like a kid's movie, right? And then it was not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very slow to start. Definitely. There, there's, there's no horror setup at all. No, no, the, not at all. The, the intro shot is just a bunch of kids playing in the street. And then our spooky man, like, our, our up, hobo, our hobo, like, our, shows our up pedo, and he, like, our pedo bum, correct, uh, starts, like, also joining in and the kids just kind of leave because they're like, why is an adult playing with our, our, our street gang? And then opening credits and we, we carry on and he continues to be kind of creepy, but we don't know to what extent. And, and then it's just full. And then, yeah, like you said, halfway into the film, we just go full on slasher. We're in for something we did not sign up for. And I loved it. I, I thought that was wonderful. Yeah, it almost lulls you into a false sense of security with its style. It definitely does. For a long time, I was like, okay, where is this going? There's definitely some fun, goofy stuff in the beginning. Like when we get introduced to our protagonist, Thomas, the little boy who has this just massive elaborate playroom with like a life-size airplane uh in it yeah the, the kid's like literally sleeping in in a in a fucking in the cockpit of a, of a plane yeah. yeah and right after that we get like a montage of him getting up for the day and getting his, all his play gear and stuff and it's set to this weird christmas themed eye of the tiger ripoff song oh, yeah and it, it's blatant like yeah. the it's it just it's just like in a different key and that's it. The opening yeah, the riff is the same and we're like, what the fuck? This weird eye of the tiger knockoff. And then the singing And then the starts. singing starts and it's obviously not a native English speaker just going Christmas it's Christmas well, before he even gets into the chorus too, like it gets really edgy and he starts singing about like oh, black angel <laughs> like like shit too and then it's Christmas. Christmas, Black Angel. Like, it's awesome. Wow, what a well, song. And and the whole time, like you said, Ben, this kid is is doing himself up like Rambo. Yes. He's he is uh, obviously obsessed with like American action heroes. He's got a goddamn snake Pliskin mullet, uh, for one. Oh thing. yeah, this this child is gone full mullet. But yeah, he like wow. he Rambo's himself up. He's got all his fake guns and like knives and swords and shit shit and he paints his face black and and he's running through the house you know ducking from plant to plant like shooting it at fake enemies and there's the whole time there's like 
the sounds of like gunfire and explosions. And I thought, okay, that's a touch by the film to like let us get into the kid's head. We're hearing what yeah, he's imagining. This is his imagination. This is what he's imagining. That's not his you actual know. playroom. That's what he imagines his playroom to be. But then after this whole thing, it cuts down to him uh, going into the basement. There's like a big <laughs> sound system set up that's broadcasting through the house, and he takes out a cassette tape uh, labeled War Sounds. And and so, oh, the, all, the, the gunfire and explosions was being projected throughout the whole fucking house. Yeah, it was actually uh, like it was non diegetic. Like, yeah. amazing. Well, it was, it was diegetic. Was diegetic. Yeah. Sorry, um, yeah. The lengths that these parents go through to make the kid happy is unbelievable. At one point, his dog's running down the hallway and a trap door opens up and the dog just falls into it. Yeah. With a net right beneath. Like, yeah, they, they went through the lengths of letting him install a trap door in the house. That's remote controlled from his like... Buzz weird, Lightyear his, fucking yeah. wrist guard. <laughs> well, I, well we, quickly, we quickly learn that not only is this kid spoiled and the son of, of very rich parents, but he's also some kind of savant. We see that he's good at everything. In the first 30 minutes of the movie, we have him we have him hacking yeah this this movie is so delightfully dated yeah we have we have him hacking uh, he has a multi monitor setup in his attic <laughs> in 1989 he's programming all of the cameras in the house so he has access to them on his uh buzz lightyear gauntlet uh which is really just like what looks like a an, an 80s era cell phone just like, like a car phone to his yeah. yeah just <laughs> massive we see him fixing the car in the garage where his grandpa sits in the car and watches him do it and then they go for a drive with this 11 year old boy driving he's the master at everything yeah so, except they make it very clear at the beginning as hyper intelligent as he is he still believes in Santa Claus. He believes in all of it. All of them. He believes in fairies and goblins and everything. So uh, one of his early conceits is trying to talk to Santa on like a, a, a message board, <laughs> which I did not even know existed in 1989. Yeah, this is well, pre-AOL. More bizarrely. It's pre-internet. He, <laughs> it, it turns out he's talking to the weird pedo hobo creep. Right, from a... From a from terminal? Like a, and the, yeah, it looked like an station? ATM almost in a train station. It was bizarre. Because it was like printing off dot matrix pictures of Santa on the screen. <laughs> And yeah. he's just standing there as it slowly reveals itself while, like, thousands of people are walking around him in the station. It's so weird and dated, and I kind of love it's, it for oh, that. Yeah. No, it, it, it has a, a great amount of charm in that sense. And, like, the kid being set up as, like, brilliant and adept at everything is, like... It's like a good setup for a, a movie that you know is going to be like a home invasion flick, you know? You're you're thinking of shit like Home Alone, and you think, okay, well, you know, Kevin McAllister wasn't a genius, and he set up some, you know, really great homemade traps for our, for the burglars. So, well, this kid, he's, he's brilliant, so he's going to set up some, like truly next level shit. I don't think that quite paid off, but we'll we'll get to that. I don't want to jump too far ahead. We should also establish the grandfather character because uh, yes. it's Christmas Eve, but the mom is going to be out late because she works for some big company that does things. Toy, she has. Toy Corporation. And she seems to be a single mother or widow. Yeah, because his, his dad's dead. So uh, the, the grandpa takes care of him for much of the movie. And the grandpa is notably very blind. Yeah, uh, we extremely get, hard of we seeing. We get a, Elder vision. a grandpa cam a few times where it's just a complete blur. They also establish that he's he's diabetic. Because yes. that, that becomes important later in the movie. And one of the things I really do have to give, like, 
pretty big kudos to the film over. Most of this is established in like a very small like dinner scene with the boy, the mom, and the grandpa. And the dialogue is like relatively naturalistic. Like all of it's delivered, like not for the sake of the viewer, but it's delivered conversationally and just going going in expecting a bad horror movie and getting like decently established exposition was very unexpected and appreciated. Like Well that that's the thing. I think we were all kind of expecting something So bad it's good. Yeah, and and really, every time we started to be like, what the fuck? What's going on with that? That doesn't make any sense. We always got an answer, a believable explanation for it's it. It's one of the point. most logical B-grade horror movies I've seen in a long time in well, terms of like explaining every single thing in a way that doesn't seem too convoluted. Yeah, you can see the amount of like love that went into every aspect of this film. It makes sense within its universe. It's yeah. over the top and goofy and ridiculous. Ridiculous, but everything has logic that you can track, mm-hmm. which was a a pleasant surprise because I don't think any of us were expecting that. No, I was I was saying uh, uh, before before you got back to the house, Ben. Uh, I was saying to Tees, I was like, you know, it's it's getting late and I'm getting pretty sleepy, and if I fall asleep during this movie, I podcast or not, I'm not going to feel bad about it. And th- the movie was amazing. I had no that was never an issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me. no, it, it kept like, the pacing up. Pretty Pretty well, like I know there's a lot of setup, but I didn't find any of the setup too excessively boring. It is pretty standard Christmas movie fare. Yeah, but it isn't particularly dry. It feels like it all has a purpose in the movie. Like everything that we're seeing has some sort of payoff later. I started to get a little bit tired of it because I went into this wanting a slasher, and I'm like, okay, well, give me a slasher and give me some. Bring action. the kill. Right, bring the kills, and um, it just doesn't for a while, and then all of a sudden it does. It, and it very much so but does. But I wonder if showing this to people and not telling them it was a slasher would make it... I think it would probably wreck their day, honestly, because of what the first kill is. <laughs> I would be mad, I think, if I got to that moment without knowing. Well, I might, I I might do that. that to my parents later. Just show them this movie. They won't be pleased when it gets <laughs> to that scene. I can I can already tell you. Like well, that's, that's if you a... don't know you're watching a horror movie, you will probably get mad at that but point. But I mean all in all, the horror itself and the the gruesomeness itself more thrillery is y- yeah. Apart it, from that it's, one, it's scene. a light horror for sure. That's, that was honestly something that I was I found myself disappointed with is that there's not really any on screen kills. It pretty much always cuts away right before the kill, except the one on-screen kill it does show is, like you mentioned, Cleveland, the first one, which is the dog. Yep. And It's uh, full on. It's horrible. We've established up to this point that, like, the dog is, like, Thomas's loyal companion. He's always there. It's a very cute dog. Then uh, crazy hobo Santa comes down the chimney, and the dog attacks him like a good dog, and he... And he he just kills it brutally with a with a fucking cake server not even a cake knife which is what he uses the entire film he never upgrades that weapon oh, really yeah, yeah yeah i was so he never he never I grabs a knife that. the whole movie he's using a, a cake server which is honestly kind of fun but yeah one, it's a fun twist but once again i wanted some gore i wanted some blood the only time we get blood at all in the movie, other than the dog, is later on when the killer, uh, like, hamstrings the child. Yep. It's like, the, the movie decides to pull its punches on some things and then doesn't on very weird things, Whoa. like the death of a dog or the the laceration of a child. Yep. Like... That's but but, you, but like, heaven forbid, showing the UPS man getting killed. Right. <laughs> or the caretakers or the cop that shows up later. You yeah, know? like, like yeah, the, the adult with a gun. Can't show that. Like, like, such weird choices. Yeah. Yeah, it almost gives me whiplash at times. Yes. Because in a lot of ways, it's very Home Alone in that even with the thriller horror elements, it is still a family film a lot of the time. And then you have the scene of the dog or the, right. the kid's... Which is just Angle not being slashed, and uh, it's intense. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I don't mind the surprise slasher film that the movie becomes. I just wish it would have committed a little bit more to that. Because I think the, the villain is is great. I Well, I mean, he's terrible, but he's great. I love the scene where he gets to the house and he's spray painting all of his hair and beard white. Oh, we yeah. see the whole Santa. sequence of that. Yeah, like he spray paints all of his <laughs> He's just beard. maniacally laughing during the whole thing. It's great. No, it's fantastic. And I mean, like, the film does a really good job of making you very uncomfortable about this man before he gets to the house like he gets the the job as like the volunteer santa because he's obviously on the hunt for for kids we have that scene of like the little girl sitting on his lap and he's just like stroking her face and like staring into her eyes and it's it's very, extremely it's creepy very very and uncomfortable the the actor they picked was a perfect choice like he looks so creepy and we saw before that he was the one like like talking with Thomas on on the the message board and was like where do you live what's your address so like he's a creep there's definitely a sense of danger for the rest of the movie even though you don't see the kills it's like ah this uh uh hobo file pedobo um whatever you want to call it i think i saw a pedobo <laughs> at uh, Bonnaroo one time <laughs> frenchman frenchman yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, for our French listeners at home, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. All, all good fun. That being said, there does still feel like a sense of danger, even though we don't see much of the violence. So in that sense, I was I was I was pretty happy. That being said, the killer does conveniently always disappear whenever Thomas needs to spend 30 minutes setting up an elaborate trap for him. <laughs> in fairness, he also conveniently appears yes. every time yes. there's a sense of security or safety. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, true that. But also, at one point, Thomas gets lost in his own house, which is... Well, he goes down into, like, what looks like the second floor of the house, and it's just a literal maze. It's an art gallery. Yeah, that's, like, they just shot it in an art gallery. It was weird. It doesn't look anything like the rest of the house. They just, like, went to a different location there's to no, shoot, like, this one little sequence. There's no rooms. It's just a series of hallways that go to nowhere. It's, like, it's literally a maze, but it all has, like, very homogenous art hanging on the walls to, like, really help you lose yourself. And then it pans up to a, a, a straight down shot from the ceiling and we see that it is a maze and that there's like two big eyes painted on the floor and like Thomas is running around like all scared and confused and can't find his way out. It's like, motherfucker, you live here. Why do you have why do you have a maze in your this is your house. You should know the maze at this point. Especially as like diehard Rambo as you are, like running around the house setting traps and going through secret passageways and stuff. If there's a fucking maze in your house as a child, you are gonna know that maze forward and backward. And then and then he leaves and we never see that locale again. Nope. <laughs> yeah, well, they they use their locations very fast and loose. I love the production design in this movie in general. I sure, have to yeah, say, like, in particular, the toy room where it's a giant, almost warehouse looking room full of his father's toys and his grandfather's toys. The one with a literal plane in it. Like his, yeah, his, it's like his, uh, his ancestors toys all the way back. And he's, he says his mom. Oh yeah, it was kind of creepy. Yeah, like, he it's says... kind of eldritch the way he gets into it with like, oh yeah, it's, it was my father's toy collection and his father's toy collection. And, and his so father's father's and just like, you look around and there's just like all of these He's just like it's like, it's like a, this child is like a dragon just hoarding, hoarding. like his well wealth. there's a literal like cross bridge to, yeah like, a rope in, bridge yeah, to yeah. get across the room and like grandpa doesn't know this is here and thomas, mom doesn't either yeah thomas tells us that mom doesn't know that this massive like you said warehouse size room is in their house he's like yeah this was just a secret between me and dad like what <laughs> <laughs> that's it's so eldritch <laughs> Yeah, it's it definitely smells of forbidden knowledge. And I, I I was hoping that that would somehow like come into the killer's downfall. Some horrible ancient magic contained in <laughs> 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 Piglet. <laughs> 
so podcasting sorry. with a dog. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just I was just hoping that that some ancient magic would be invoked in this toy room to like bring all the dolls to life or something and and kill the pedo Santa. Alas, <laughs> we never got resolution on that room. Like many things in this movie, we never get resolution on. But man, in terms of set design, you're right. It's so great. We all made the comparison in this movie to The Shining in that like the lot, there's no logic to the house. Yeah, a lot of impossible architecture and stuff yeah. like that. Hallways that go nowhere. You can never orient yourself. You can never tell where you are in the house. Considering that, like, the last half of the movie is a big game of hide and seek, you know, that's pretty effective. Yeah. I, I, I would want that. The design of all that stuff is great. In the second half, it really kind of goes full on cat and mouse. Some of the logic is kind of thrown to the wayside at that point. But it is legitimately fun the majority of the time. Like, for example, at one point, Thomas is hiding in the their workout room and the killer goes in, doesn't see him and goes into the sauna and he like unrolls himself from the carpet. Oh, Thomas yeah, that does, was really fun. And then locks him in the sauna and turns it on to max heat. Which is a very Home Alone thing. It's a fun trick, and one after he gets out the rest of the movie, he's kind of, like, uh, scorched. Yeah. He's, he's singed. He's got some burns on his face and stuff. The, uh, yeah, the, the makeup on the Santa is, is relatively inconsistent to, like, scene to scene. You get a sense that probably they shot a few of those things out of order. Because there's a sequence where he sets yeah. him on fire, and then in the next scene he's not burned, but at the end he is. Um, yeah, see, I noticed that too. A, a few, there's a few little things, but it's all, it's all very minor and in good fun. That kind of translates into another issue that I had with the movie, uh, kind of in the same vein as like it pulling its punches on the kills when I don't think it should. Thomas sets up some very elaborate, creative traps for the killer. Jigsaw-esque. Yeah, jigsaw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Truly. Well, well said. Jigsaw-esque <laughs> traps. But none of them really pay off in a way that I found satisfying because they he, he always... did put a rifle on the wall, didn't he? I'm not I'm not I think imagining that was, that wrong. I think that was the crossbows. I think Oh so shooting the darts. Yeah, there's there's one oh, trap okay. where he puts like two crossbows. Because the handle like you only see the handle when he's setting it up, and you right. you think that he's just straight up putting a rifle on the wall to like yeah, we're, blast we're this all fucking like, oh hobo. My God. <laughs> well, it's bizarre because he's shot with two darts. Like, in his cool. neck. Yeah, like like bar darts. He like no sells it and then we don't see it again. Well that's that's my that's my <laughs> point, is that like we have like five minutes of him setting up this elaborate crossbow trap. Hobo Santa sets it off, two darts are shot into the side of his neck, and it immediately cuts to a different scene. We don't see him reacting to it, and the next time well, we... Well, it cuts to the next trap. It's like they were so concerned with showing the traps that right. they didn't think about showing well, it cuts, the it cuts effects to of the Thomas, traps. It cuts to Thomas setting up the next yeah, trap. Yeah, exactly. It's not even like in Home Alone, we have the big montage of him rigging the whole house and waiting for the wet bandits to show up, and it's like, okay, we've seen him set up all these traps. When are they going to set them off? In this one, it's... Thomas sets up a trap, killer activates it and no sells it, cut to Thomas setting up the next trap, so on and so forth. And it's like, why don't we have the killer reacting to these these traps? Why does it cut as soon as they're triggered and move on to the next? Yeah, thing? we don't we it's, don't get the payoff. Well, we don't. It's like like you said, Ben, there's like a sense of urgency to get on to the next one. But I would rather see less of the trap being set up and more of the reaction. Well, more of part the of the reason why it works so well in Home Alone is it's almost a slapstick. In it's totally half. slapstick. You know? And you just and you continue to see Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern getting more and more beat up yeah. and trying to go all the different ways into the house and just running into new traps. And by the time they finally actually get to Kevin, they're shattered, basically. Mm -hmm. They're destroyed. That's what's so funny about it. And like the only trap that Thomas sets up in this movie is the least elaborate trap of all, the 
sauna that actually we actually see hurt the killer. That's pretty much it. I, I found like the idea of the traps is very fun. Like the train, the little choo choo train gag. Oh, that sequence is, is awesome. Great. Yeah. It's a fantastic sequence. It doesn't have a very satisfying payoff once again. Well, I kind of like that it was a dud actually. That one, I think I would have been more okay with being a dud if I had gotten more from the, the traps leading up to it. You know I, what I mean? I, I, I would agree with that. I think they pull their punches a bit much with the, the traps just because I, I almost feel like they were focused on making it a serious home invasion thing that they were nervous about going to slapsticky with it I would, which i i think is almost a detriment yeah i, I, I would say i would I say yeah it just it in contrast to the toy dragon cavern with the plane in it right if you're gonna have that go ham with the rest but really i think uh, as much as we've picked it apart I, I do see it as a minor thing personally like it's it's not it's not too it's fairly small. minor for me, for me too yeah, I, I, I think I, it, it hurts the movie more than i would like it to for me because i think it's the like, legacy of home alone kind of affects the view of it as well because yes. we're so accustomed culturally to seeing you know these traps with elaborate slapsticky payoff i suppose but Honestly, when we were watching it, like the the film is stylistically different enough that I didn't really find myself thinking of Home Alone all that often. I'd pick up, pull out the the occasional comparison here and there, but I I don't feel like Home Alone was my major point of comparison for this film. That being said, the setups are great. I just wish that they had more payoff. I think that that would have made made them more satisfying because a lot of times I just feel left with like blue balls kind of, especially because the set pieces are so elaborate and the production design is so good. There's so much of Thomas setting up stuff. It's like the foreplay is great, but let me bust, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you and the hobo have that in common. Uh, don't don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, uh, why don't we get into the um, uh, the the sort of the the diehard Dark Knight of the Soul moment? Gee, yeah, probably my favorite part of the movie. Yes, because uh, it's the weirdest. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, he's chased by the killer. He's had to hide his grandpa in uh, a fridge and also a suit of armor. By yeah, this point, he puts his grandpa <laughs> in. Yep. And, uh, and he's all he's also been uh, he's been uh, stabbed in the leg at this point. Oh, he has been. He has, yeah. he has a, a, a very large, sloppy, he makeshift literally cast. takes like half or, of a chair and attaches it it's to dope, the side. Frankly, yeah, it's, yeah, it's fucking a, rad. Like it's a, a great choice. It's like a, a makeshift crutch slash uh, splint. splint. It's bad for him at this point. Also, one thing we didn't we didn't mention is that for the duration of this movie, he believes that this man is the real santa claus that's important to note yeah footnote on that he we'll be coming back yeah, to that he doesn't he doesn't think that this guy is just some crazy hobo who's broken into his house dressed as santa claus he thinks that he is engaged in a battle with the real saint nick part of the opening of the movie was him intentionally staying up past midnight yeah, at that's Christmas why he's time. setting up all the cameras and mm -hmm. stuff and which is why he was under the table in front of the fireplace when he come when the the killer comes down and on the phone, his mom told him, like, oh, don't look at Santa Claus. He'll get angry and turn into an ogre. So she's kind of primed him for this. He's having a real bad time. He's injured. He's had to stash his grandpa in a suit of armor. Uh, his dog's dead. He thinks that, like, Santa Claus, who is, like, the epitome of, like, joy for children coming and giving presents and laughter and happiness, has, like, turned on him and is trying to murder him so he's, he's fucked up for life yeah uh yeah like he's got ptsd he goes to bury his dog in the basement yeah my god i forgot like that we get a sequence where the child buries his dog the, honestly the basement is like a night wow. is like a nightmare on elm street boiler room with mm -hmm. a dirt floor and this whole time this song starts playing <laughs> It starts out innocuous enough. We we figured, oh, it's just another one of these like poorly translated songs, just like the the opening one. But then it gets it gets weirder because <laughs> it starts talking about 
how hard it is to grow up and be a man and and then just starts uh, belting out happy birthday Christmas welcome home Jesus well we looked it up after <laughs> this the movie is the ended part. <laughs> and like, the song like, was an original song written by none other than Bonnie Taylor most famous for uh, a little song called Total Eclipse of the Heart yeah. <laughs> yep What's so baffling about it is she's a native English speaker. Yes, exactly. Like here we are, like laughing at like this, like happy birthday, happy Christmas. birthday Christmas. And it's like, yeah, I get it. It's Christ's birthday, but like it's just it's such a weird way to phrase it. And like talking also about like right, that's happy birthday, Christmas, time to grow up and be a man. Like <laughs> what the fuck is this song? And and so we're just like well, laughing. It's like oh, it's English. It's funny. And then like and then we look it up. It's like wait, no, this was written by a native English speaker. What? Yeah, well, by Bonnie Tyler. Like, it was uh, my sung brain by is broken. A, a native English speaker. I don't know about that. Yeah, don't maybe, have that maybe she didn't write this one, but uh, we did find there's a there's an official music video for oh, this song boy, is there. that we watched after the movie. I would definitely recommend looking that up on YouTube. It's kind of depressing, but it's well, it's she's funny. Bonnie Tyler is. V- very obviously not sober. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Bonnie Tyler, it, like, I don't know what she's. I don't know what she's fucked up on, but she's drunk or high or something because she's like stumbling around the room and like leaning on things while she's singing. Yeah, and she looks a little like sad, and it, it doesn't appear to be a bit like it doesn't appear to be like. Uh, her playing a character while she's singing. No, no. not at all. It seems very genuine, and uh, maybe she's just that good of an actress, but like... And the music video has nothing to do with Christmas either. At all. It's in like... It's in like an... A smoky bar. It's in like an empty, like, casino or something, or gambling room. Some sort. Yeah, there's like, there's a a poker table and like an empty bar and it's just like her stumbling around this room singing happy birthday Christmas, welcome home Jesus. Well, it's so funny because... Time to grow up and be a man. It starts, the music video literally starts with a close up of a sign that says no smoking. (laughs) And over the course of the music video, the room just gets smokier and smokier. Well, at one point she's, she's standing by what is obviously a lit a still lit cigarette like they've put something in front of it so you can't actually see it but the smoke is coming up from it it's just like on the table it's like what is what's going on here it's truly the most bizarre thing to come out of this movie is this song yes and to have it to have it overlaid with this like traumatic moment of of this child burying his dog and like trying to rally himself to to kill santa claus and i guess be a man and i yeah be a fucking man it's time (laughs) welcome home jesus happy birthday christmas time to be a fucking man (laughs) i I was not prepared for this movie (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's my favorite part of the movie by far because it's i think it's the best part it's definitely the fucking weirdest oh yeah yes. it, it got tears out of all of us I yeah think, during it, the scene. like we were we were just just dying one of the most bizarre mismatches in the movie full of mismatches yes. and weird mashups of uh ideas and genres amazing sequence honestly Truly. yeah another interesting decision that the film takes is at the end I guess we find out that the killer isn't there because he's a pedo. It's just because he wants to to play. Yeah, like he he gets a hold of the kid, puts the knife to his neck and it's like, all right, I did it. Your turn, and then he lets him go, yeah, and it's like I, count I to won. twenty. You know, don't now, cheat. No, I'm gonna. And then hide just and runs off. Seek. Yeah, we start to get a hint at that when like the with the train gag where the kid rigs like he has this little plastic grenade that, that he turns into an actual, actual grenade, grenade <laughs> um, and and ties it to uh, the back of this little uh, train, and there we have the great sequence of him like sending it at the killer, and the killer like picking it up and turning it around and sending it back well he him. rigs it so that if it hits something it'll start the lighter yeah. that starts to fuse and right obviously but it doesn't hit him he grabs it first and it's almost like a looney tunes-esque sequence 
Well, yeah, the killer. Where it's like it feels like a Roadrunner gag. The the uh, killer like picks up this like toy train and he like looks at it with like this childlike sense of wonder and delight and like winds it back up and like sends it back the other direction like he doesn't realize that it's a booby trap and it's like that's when I was like okay what what's going on with this killer here because like up till that point it's like he just wants to fuck these kids like that's that's it but then with that and capturing Thomas and being like, okay, I got you. Now I'm going to go hide and you find me count to 20. But he's also murdered all of these people. He just wanted to be a kid. I, I is, think, it, is it a Michael Jackson? I think Jackson? he was a crazy person. And is it a Michael Jackson thing? Like he, he just wanted to be a child. I don't know. He just lost his goddamn mind. Clearly. Cause he killed the dog and yeah. Well, he, and he uh, killed a bunch of pe- yeah, actual gun- people. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. He did like slash, Thomas's leg and like kind of cripple him so like he's not he's not innocent by any means but it's just it's a weird kind of subversion at the end it's like haha I went through all of this and murdered a bunch of people and broke into your house not to rape you but to play hide and seek with you (laughs) okay I guess that's abandoned almost immediately too because uh, Thomas agrees Counts to like three and then starts running off and uh, well, yeah, he has to run down to the caretaker's house to get insulin for his diabetic grandpa who's still in this suit of armor, <laughs> which we I don't think we've given enough time to the fact that <laughs> what? they put him in a full suit of armor in this in this gigantic mansion with just like dozens of rooms and probably countless hiding places already established their secret passages that they decided to put the grandpa inside a suit of armor. Yeah, in like it's the like, entrance hall. It looks like a statue because it's like attached behind. Yeah, to it's like, like a hung wire up. Yeah. and everything. It's super elaborate to the point where it does not seem like nearly the best hiding spot whatsoever. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, especially considering like once again, like you said, Tees, it's in the entrance hall. It's by the door. <laughs> right. He can leave. Yeah, he could have left any time. There's another home nearby. Well, we don't we don't even see how they got him into the armor because later on Thomas struggles to get him out of the armor <laughs> once he's gone into a diabetic coma. Mm-hmm. But like that's a great point. Like why doesn't he like when the killer's off somewhere like why didn't he just leave? I mean, I know he's old and blind and diabetic, but like it seems better than staying in a suit of armor. <laughs> next to the front door you know i i don't know <laughs> yeah it's baffling well they try to leave near the beginning with the car and they yeah. actually get it started right before it gets destroyed by our killer i did like when the killer like first hit bashes his head against the windshield and just like sends a huge spider web crack through it yeah that was pretty good yeah I mean, that, you know, that's like at the start of all of the action. So it's like, OK, ooh, things are really starting to gear up. Oh, here. yeah. And you get that that wonderful like 80s blue light, you know, where the killer's backlit. Like, yeah, with like the, the fog machine. Classic. Yeah. Fucking classic. I've I don't even remember. Does he just shoot the killer at the end? Grandpa yeah, does. So they, uh, Grandpa does. That's yep. right. He gets the insulin for Grandpa. And... Insulin the nick of time. Insulin. Nope. No, no. no. Insulin, no. <laughs> Insolent. I normally could come up with a better pod, but just, I don't know. Diabetes me. I don't know. Oh, well. He gets the insulin back to Grandpa. Uh, think Grandpa's dead, but he's not. He resuscitates at the last minute uh, when the killer is about to maybe kill Tommy for real this time maybe not who knows grandpa gets the gun and even though he's blind shoots the killer yeah well we do get another uh shot uh, from elder vision where yeah. there's a big red blob and a very small blob and he has to try and figure out which one to shoot at <laughs> how do i hit this moving target i would have it would have been so funny if he had accidentally shot the kid though <laughs> what a way to end the movie yeah. but i mean in fairness we do get a second best ending with yes the the mom gets to the house finally she's been she's been driving to the house for most of the movie yep uh to see in the entrance 
a dead Santa Claus looking man. Yep. Yeah. Her uh, grandfather with, like passed out on the ground and, and a totally shell shocked. Thomas. Yeah, this kid's just got this thousand yard stare, just like gazing <laughs> off into the distance. He's just like, Tommy, Tommy, are are you are you okay? Are you what's going on? And just keeps just fucking I staring. I just out. wanted to see Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then and then credits roll it's like uh, yikes <laughs> it's wasting no time yeah we right. don't get a resolution like that that's is it. our resolution yeah, right like there. He, he has ptsd forever this kid's <laughs> fucked for life yeah if i had to guess i would say the next 30 minutes probably consisted of mom telling him that santa's not real and and, then, and him still not believing, yeah, <laughs> believing he killed Santa. Yeah, had a he had a real traumatic night to be sure. What a fucking truly bizarre film, bizarre but mostly well made. I was expecting it to be trash, and it wasn't trash. I thought it was delightful. It was fucking great. I also thought it was delightful. I wish that it went a little bit farther. I wish we got those payoffs for the traps, and I wish we actually saw some some creative, fun kills. I will say, though, what we did get to see was pretty fucking great. Yeah, and I love like, all I wouldn't the, replace anything. I love all all of the dated technology and yeah, it, same. It, it leaves such a charm and it almost has like a weird early MTV vibe at times with the the super high key lighting yeah. and the the fast editing at times it's really bizarre but it's one of a kind and i would absolutely recommend it it is one of a kind i can definitely agree with that uh despite the comparisons to home alone weren't you saying that the people who made this movie tried to sue the yeah. production of yeah. home alone for for plagiarism yeah i don't know what happened such? about that i i saw that they tried to sue with the the director claiming that he saw home alone and stated oh they ripped off every bit of my film I, I see similarities, you know. Yeah, but, but I don't. Also, like this entire film is a love letter to other films, be it Rambo, Die Hard, etc. Right, exactly. Like it, it, in of itself, could be accused of like it's, you know, it's like a it's a weird Die Hard film. Honestly, like, it seems it seems a little bit like he's being a sore loser because Home Alone did better than mm -hmm, than his yeah. movie. Uh, because... And it's like Home Alone, you can't really compare to Rambo. No, like like but this film you absolutely can in a half like this film is very like both Rambo protag inspired both protagonists end, well, end up horribly traumatized. That's what's so funny about this movie and what makes it truly unique. I don't think there's many if any movies where you could say it's equal parts Home Alone and Rambo equal parts kids movie and gritty action movie. True. <laughs> It's definitely a one-of-a-kind film. I've never seen anything quite like it, and doubt I will see anything quite like it ever again. Do you want to rate? Yeah. Cleveland, let's start with you. Okay. Um, I do agree with your, uh, your sentiments. I was laughing consistently, and uh, it's been a while, I think, since I've, I've laughed to the point of tears with you guys. And like, I don't know, like growing up, like we used to watch some really funny stuff, Tease, and you know, we'd, we'd laugh to the point of tears over just weird shit, you know, we'd come across and just happy birthday, Christmas, man. Happy birthday, Christmas, dude. It's Seriously. so good. And I, that, that key moment is, is so, such a delight. And there's so many delightful moments. It's, it's consistently entertaining. I'm going to give it a strong four. I adored this movie. Hedge it a 4.5. I'm going to stick with four, but hot damn, great movie. What what a what a ride. Word. Well, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it overall as well. I thought it was pretty fun. Totally unique and bizarre uh, in all of the best ways. Happy birthday, Christmas. It has to be like one of the funniest memes we've pulled out of a movie in a long time, <laughs> I think. Uh, so I will definitely remember it for that. That being said, I do have to, to dock it pretty harshly for not really living up to what it sets up in a lot lot of ways still enjoyed it but fell short in several key ways for me i'm gonna give it a three out of five 
Man, I've been looking forward to this movie for months, and I have to say, I was not disappointed. While I, I agree with some of your sentiments that it could have gone farther in a lot of aspects, I definitely think this is one of those movies that deserves to be pulled from obscurity, and it deserves a cult yes, status, you I know? Agree. It deserves a for cult sure. following, absolutely. And if you're looking for a more off-the-beaten-trail Christmas movie, you're sick of watching Elf or Die Hard, or... Uh, I mean, who's sick of watching Die Hard, though? True, true. In fairness, I was just counting it as a Christmas You need another movie. Christmas movie to watch. I've never, or, I've never seen Elf, and I'm sick of that movie. Yeah, <laughs> if you're sick of the standard fare, Jingle All the Way, even though I love Jingle All the Way, I'll, I will say. That's a great movie. Um, or Home Alone, or any of those. White Christmas, uh, etc. Check out this movie. I think it's not a perfect movie, but it's a whole lot of fun. And it's fun, I think, if you know nothing about it. Bring it to a party and put it on not even telling them it's a slasher or a thriller movie and see the results. I think... Again, you might piss off some people for the dog part, but apart from that, yes, I agree. Like, to throw them off. I I think it's a blast. Well, I think you're overstating the gruesomeness of the dog scene. I mean, he stabs it, like, in the throat. Like, we see all of it. It's pretty rough. It's like a child's dog he's watching get slaughtered in front of him like it's it's pretty hair hairy man it's it's a gritty uh child trauma experience for sure <laughs> but it is absolutely Time a to blast to watch be a man yeah happy birthday christmas <laughs> i'm gonna give it a four out of five all right well that'll give dial code santa claus or game over or whatever of its myriad titles you want to call it a 3.7 out of five uh, yeah, despite my pretty big qualms with it, I would definitely recommend it. I think yes. you're absolutely right that it's a film that deserves to be pulled from obscurity. The more people who see it, the better. Next week, though, next week, next week, we're going to be talking about one of the uh, more critically acclaimed Christmas horror movies, one that I shamefully have not seen, but I'm very excited to watch for the first time. We're going to be covering Joe Dante's classic Gremlins. With a Uh, special guest. Yes, returning uh, John from our Return of the Living Living Dead Dead episode. episode. I blanked on the title of that movie. (laughs) Um, There's so many Living Dead movies. Um, So that's going to be very exciting. I've seen Gremlins 2 several times, but I've never seen the original. Wow. I know. (laughs) That is surprising. It's the opposite for me. I've seen Gremlins several times, but I've never seen Gremlins 2. Well, we'll we'll get around to Gremlins 2 at some point. Uh, Yeah, Gremlins 2 is a treat. Gremlins, the original, is also a delightful movie. Yes. So I'm very excited. I'm really, yes. I'm really excited. I love Joe Dante. This is a, a gap in my film history knowledge that I've been needing to fill for a long time. So we going to do it next week. Uh, so stay tuned until then. Would you like a piece of gum? A piece of gum? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't have it yet, but more on that later. You can go ahead and finish up your bit. Uh, what? <laughs> Um, if you like the show, uh, <laughs> I, I don't trust whatever this is. <laughs> if you like the show, go over to Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts and leave us a five star rating and a nice review. Also, you can follow us on Twitter at Pod People Pod. I don't, I don't like the way you're looking at me. <laughs> uh, follow us on. <laughs> <laughs> Follow us on Twitter at PodPeoplePod or on Letterboxd.com slash PodPeoplePod for a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to those episodes. Uh, <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter at Deep State Ozzy. I'm on Twitter at Mr. Sheets. And this episode was brought to you God by damn. Chekhov's Gum. <laughs> Ever tired of not having a piece of gum? Don't worry about it. With Chekhov's gum, all you have to do is pre-establish it in a conversation beforehand, and then what do you know? At some point, it comes up useful again. Chekhov's gum. It, it, it sure is, sure is gummy <laughs> and relevant.
Uh, for real though, you can find me on uh, uh, tweeting occasionally for Light Arc Studio um, and working on the delightful, dark, and spooky indie RTS game. It stares back. Dare to gaze into the void. Check us out on Steam and give us a whirl. We're in early access right now, and uh, yeah, kicking I, ass and taking names. I believe we're gonna be having a sale soon as well on Steam for the holidays. Potentially. Maybe more on that at a later date. It stirs back is only six dollars right now. Yeah, so that's yeah. should be like three. It's cheap so like, already. you know, or something. Uh, yeah, so definitely check that out and let us know what you think. But now it's time for us to sign off. So all I have to say is once and for all, happy birthday, Christmas. Welcome home, Jesus. Time to be a man. Time to grow up and be a man. Sing us out, Bonnie. <laughs> Change the plan.